If you haven't heard the news, in July 2020, ISACA released the new and updated version of their flagship governance framework, Seed Guide. And folks, the timing couldn't be better because digital transformation, new compliance requirements, and a global shift that was accelerated sharply by the pandemic is rapidly expanding enterprises' technology footprints. Never has strong IT governance been more critical for enterprise success. So let's talk a little bit about the 2020 C-Guide exam. Some of the things we'll cover here today, we'll talk about the key changes to the 2020 C-Guide format, requirements, cover the new and updated content domains. I'll give you some exam essentials. And finally, like always, my exam preparation tips. Let's jump on and see what we've got. ISACA is certified in the Governance of Enterprise IT Professional Certification. It is the only governance certification that can give you the mindset to access, design, implement, and manage enterprise IT governance systems aligned with your overall business goals. It is globally accepted and recognized and is framework agnostic. It addresses an overarching governance posture that associates with multiple relevant frameworks, standards, bodies of knowledge, and models that are relevant and valuable to your overall governance system. The new C-Guide exam offers concise job practice areas addressing new trends, technologies, and changing business needs that are designed to keep you at the top of your game and improve business performance. This update can not only help you in your career, but can also enable you to think strategically, plan proactively and optimize resources, deliver business value, and mitigate risk and streamline operations, including and especially during times of crisis. Seaguide recognizes a range of professionals for their knowledge and application of enterprise IT governance principles and practices. To earn the Seaguide designation, you must meet the following requirements. Of course, you have to pass the exam. We'll talk about that in some future slides. Submit your application. You have to do that within five years of passing the exam with verified evidence of a minimum of at least five or more years of experience in an advisory or oversight role supporting the governance of IT-related contribution to an enterprise. Currently, there's a waiver for the one-year requirement related to Domain 1, and that may be obtained by holding a COVID-2019 Design and Implementation Certificate. I recommend that you first review the exam content outline for any certification of interest to ensure that your work experience qualifies, then review any other specific requirements as well. ISACA sets forth a code of professional ethics to guide the professional and personal conduct of its members and certification holders. Members and those certified are required to abide by ISACA's code of professional ethics. To maintain your C guide, you must earn and report a minimum of 120 CPE hours every three-year reporting cycle and at least 20 hours annually. This reporting is due by the end of each calendar year and is required to renew through the following year. Let's jump into a couple of the changes that we see out there. The new CGOT exam domains address new trends, emerging technologies, and changing business needs, accounting for the latest governance industry practices. The first we'll talk are the exam preparation materials. The CGOT Review Manual 8th Edition and CGOT Review Questions, Answers, and Explanations Manual 5th Edition have been revised and updated to reflect the 2020 outline. Additionally, ISACA launched the new CGOT Review Questions, Answers, and Explanations database, and this is a 12-month subscription. These resources, I believe, are the best to use when preparing for a CGOT exam to be administered on the 2nd of July of 2020 or later. These revised materials provide updated technology references and coverage of topics that are new to the 2020 outline. Next on the exam content outline, a format change to outline exam specifications focus on areas of knowledge as opposed to task statements. The new outline contains a list of secondary task statements or activities that apply the knowledge from each of the four domains. The inclusion of several new subtopic areas relevant to IT governance professionals also is in there, and the integration of knowledge related to the previous domain, which was called strategic management, goes now throughout all four domains of the new content outline. Here's our four domains, governance of enterprise IT, IT resources, benefits realization, and risk optimization. We'll take a look at what each of these has. First, 
Governance of Enterprise IT. This domain basically has three major areas. We have governance framework, technology governance, and information governance. In this domain, you can expect about 40% of the questions coming from this domain. Next, we have IT resources. Two big areas here, IT resource planning and IT resource optimization. And of course, in the exam, you can expect about 15% of the questions to come from here. Next, we have benefits realization. In this area, we include IT performance and oversight and management of IT-enabled investments. In the exam, you can expect about 26% of the questions from benefits realization. And finally, risk optimization. This includes areas like risk strategy and risk management. And of course, in the exam, you can expect about 19% of the exam questions coming from risk optimization. So speaking of the exam, let's see what the exam looks like. The Sea Guide Certification Working Group oversees the development of this exam, ensuring that the job practice is properly tested. There will be 150 multiple choice questions, and there's one best answer from four options, A, B, C, or D. You'll have four hours or 240 minutes to take the exam, which allows for a little over a minute and a half per question. Sea Guide Certification exams can now be taken via online remote proctored or at an in-person testing center. You'll schedule your exam for any available date, time, or location within the 365-day eligibility period. If you're within 48 hours of your scheduled testing appointment, you must take the exam or forfeit the registration fee. Please note that the payment is required before you schedule the exam, and it's about $575 for members and $760 for non-members. Scores are reported as a scaled score. This is a conversion of your raw score on the exam to a common scale from 200 to 800 and to pass you must receive a score of 450 or higher which represents a minimum consistent standard of knowledge as established by Osaka Sea Guide certification. You can find more information on this and register for the exam at isaka.org. So let's jump into how you might prepare for the exam and some of my tips here. I would suggest first get the candidate information guide. This gives a lot of practical information on the exam. It includes exam registration, deadlines, and details for exam day administration. It even has significant information such as the exam domains, the number of questions, its length, and the languages available. No one should take the ISACA Sea Guide exam without reading this guide. Next, we have the Sea Guide Review Manual. I can tell you this is a must read. The manual is available in ebook and hard copy format, and it's arranged according to Sea Guide's four job practice areas. If you're using the Sea Guide Review Manual, you can be sure of one thing the answer or the way to determine the answer to every question on the actual exam is somewhere amongst the pages of this guide. We also have the sample exam questions. I would sign up for the QA database. This is a subscription with interactive, customizable sample exams that draw from a database of multiple questions. You can view your results by job practice domain and it gets you a look into where to focus your study time. Of course, a really cool resource is the exam preparation community. This exam preparation online forum is a great place to ask questions, answer practice exam questions, and share ideas and your experiences to help successfully prepare for this exam or you could take an accredited C guide course. Now there are a few choices here and three suggested places I would look. First, go to the ISACA site. You can find information out about in-person training and conferences, customized on-site corporate training, virtual instructor-led courses, which are really intensive exam cram style courses that will cover some of the more challenging topics from the job practices. You can go to your local ISACA chapter Chapters routinely host exam preparation courses and many of them have accredited trainers. You may want to ask your chapter leadership or check out your chapter website to see if there's an upcoming prep course. Finally, you can find an accredited training provider who can teach the class for you. It's very important that they are accredited. Where can you find this information? Of course, on the ISACA site or APMG. Now, APMG accredited trainers have been assessed to the International Best Practice Standard of ISO 17024. In addition to having passed rigorous product knowledge interviews and training skills assessments, APMG accredited trainers are continuously monitored to provide exemplary course delivery for customers.
and as always, create a study plan for your learning style. If you're already working or have other commitments, make sure you can dedicate sufficient time to the basics, such as covering all exam topics, taking practice tests, and reviewing exam simulations. Some people prefer self-learning, while others think there's no substitute for the classroom. Use your past learning experiences to help you pick the method to help you prepare the best. Because even very experienced professionals with great knowledge about the certification subject can have a hard time during the examination. Now, your personal experience can save you some study time, but you should take into consideration factors such as the exam question and length logic, because relying too much on experience alone is a bad strategy that will likely lead to bad results. No surprises here. Of course, we know we read each question carefully because you know one word can throw off an entire answer. And I like to eliminate known incorrect answers. Of course, that's going to increase your odds a little bit of picking the right answer. You make the right choice, but be careful. Look for those key words or phrases in the question such as most, best, or first. And always be careful with those answers that are absolutes like always and never and so on. And of course, answer all questions. So we've hit a little bit on general exam tips. I've got a couple of examples for you for taking this exam. My top tip number one, do not rely on your personal experience to answer the questions. Think about CGUI content. Now, I mentioned earlier, it certainly helps. But oftentimes, the way you do it or the way you've done it may not be consistent with the CGUI text. Which role in the enterprise is the most appropriate role to determine long and short-term plans for the IT department. This is one of those that can really throw you off if your organization sees these roles differently. Let's take a look. Board of Directors, I will say this is incorrect. Now, you may want to choose this one, but the Board of Directors is the most senior executives and or non-executive directors who are accountable for governance and the overall control of the enterprise resources. Although they may influence long-term plans, they're not focusing on short-term plans. Let's get rid of A. B says the IT steering committee. Now, I like this one. Why? This is a planning or a steering committee that oversees the IT function and its activities and is an important factor in ensuring that the IT department is really in harmony with the mission and objectives of the enterprise. The IT steering committee typically serves as a general review board for major projects and initiatives and should not become involved in routine operations. One of the functions performed by this committee is reviewing the long and short range plans of the IT department to ensure that they align with the enterprise objectives. Let's keep that on our list. Architecture Review Board, incorrect. This is a group of stakeholders and experts accountable for guiding enterprise architecture related matters and decisions for setting architectural policies and standards. Again, your organization may see it differently. And finally, here's another one that could be tough. Program Management Office, incorrect. You might have leaned towards this, but this function is responsible for supporting program and project managers and for gathering, assessing, and reporting information about the conduct of programs and constituent projects. Your PMO may determine long and short-term plans for the IT department, but generally IT plans are much more broad than individual projects. Folks, we're going with B, IT Steering Committee, on this one. My second tip, try to identify which domain the question is coming from, because you may find that many of the incorrect answers come from other domains. Now, we covered those four domains a few minutes ago because you might see an answer that sounds like the right answer, but it comes from a different domain in C Guide. Let's take a look. The Goals Cascade helps determine value based on stakeholder needs and enterprise goals. Which of the following would be the most appropriate C Guide domain for this description? I found that oftentimes if you can determine, like I said, which domain this is coming from, you can increase your ability to select the right answer. It helps if you remove the answers that are not appropriate. You may remember that the goals cascade comes up all over the place. It really comes up in two domains within C Guide: the governance of enterprise IT domain and the benefits realization domain. So since I remember that the goals cascade comes up in those two, I can probably get rid 
of two of these possible answers. So let's take a look. IT resources, which is B. That's going to be incorrect because the ghost cascade is not mentioned in this domain, but it could be a factor. So let's get rid of B. C says risk optimization. Although we do align our risks with enterprise goals, the risk optimization domain does not mention this, but it could be a factor. So let's cross that off. We're down to A and D. A says governance of enterprise IT. Well, this is partially correct. The goals cascade is identified in this domain, but it is specifically focused on strategic planning. This translation allows setting of specific goals at every level and in every area of the enterprise in support of the overall goals and the stakeholder requirements. And thus it effectively supports alignment between enterprise needs in IT solutions and services. So I like that answer, but let's see benefits realization. Benefits realization is correct. In this domain, the goals cascade is used to help determine value based on stakeholder needs and enterprise goals, which comes directly out of the question. Let's get rid of A and go with D. And for my last tip, hey guys, if all else fails and you are completely lost in a question, pick the one that creates the most actionable value from your stakeholder's perspective. This happens a lot. You have no clue what the answer is. Remove yourself from that question and say, hey, I'm a stakeholder of this. What would I expect my information and technology group to do? Let's take a look. Which is a primary reason to maintaining a risk register? Okay, so we know the risk register generally comes from the risk optimization domain, but let's take a look at the answers here. A says, record the likelihood of all risks the enterprise is facing. That sounds like a great answer, but it says the primary reason. Now remember, likelihood is just one of the areas we use to assess risks. We look at likelihood and impact. So I think that sounds great, but it's only half correct. Let's get rid of that one. I'm really looking more for how the risks in the register are linked to business value here, because I want to remove myself and say, what is it that would be most beneficial to the enterprise? I think we get rid of A. Track the status of risks faced by the organization and their impact on business goals. I like that. Why? It's the status of the risks, but it looks at the impact on business goals. If I am a stakeholder, that's very important to me. Let's keep B. Record all relevant key risk indicators. It sounds great, but this is not actionable. Just having key risk indicators says we have a measurement system in place, but it's not telling me the action is performing like B did, where it linked these to the impact on business goals. Get rid of C. Support the elimination of all major risks. This is an easy one for me to get rid of. Why is that? You can't eliminate all major risks. Because remember, once we've identified a risk, we may choose to accept it, avoid it, mitigate it, or transfer it. We can't eliminate major risks. Guys, let's go with B. It seems to have the most value for my stakeholders. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, a few tips on the new CGOT exam. Stay in touch with me on scout.com, markthomasonline.com, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Hey, everyone, good luck on the CGOT exam. We'll see you in the next video.